morning, afternoon, depending on wherever you are. Uh, I'm Shatwik, along with Anisha Chidgupi and Sam Sondarajan. I welcome you to the inaugural lecture of the Dissecting Capitalism well, uh, webinar series. We are deeply honored that Professor uh, Bromley has kindly agreed to give this lecture titled uh, Globalization as a Threat to Democracy. Uh, we also feel lucky that Sabina Alkarin, Anthony DeCosta, Aina Overby, Benjamin Davy, Elizabeth Anderson, and Robert Walker, and Sanjay Reddy has also agreed uh, to share their research and uh, time with us uh, during the upcoming uh, sessions. As the name suggests of this, um, about this webinar series, uh, during, during this series, we are going to dissect capitalism, not in a medical sense, but theoretical and empirical sense. Uh, capitalism, capitalism has magical powers. It has uplifted millions of people out of poverty and destitution. At the same time, thanks to the way it operates, we have successfully arrived at the age of Anthropocene. If the world leaders at COP23 or 26 uh, cannot agree uh, on the guiding principle that shapes our uh, present uh, capitalist means of production and consumption and living, Within our lifetime, we might see unimaginable human and planetary catastrophe. Yes, uh, therefore, it's a good time that we ask uh, questions to capitalism. There are other side who think that capitalism can become uh, a savior. We should also look at that part too. So with this, now I would like to request Anisha to introduce Professor Bromley. Thank you. Thank you, Satwik. A very warm welcome to all our participants, and it is an honor to introduce Professor Daniel Bromley. He is an Anderson Bascom Professor of Applied Economics Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His work focuses on institutional economics, the philosophical foundations of economics, environmental policy, and international development. He served 44 years as the editor of the journal Land Economics. He's listed in Who's Who in Economics and is a fellow of several professional societies. He was a visiting professor at the Humboldt University in Berlin from 2009 to 14. And in 2011, he was awarded a prestigious prize from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation in Germany in recognition for his contributions to economics in Germany and towards the European community. In 2016, he received the Webblum Commons Award from the Association for Evolutionary Economics. Apart from having published and you know, cited widely, the situated topic that we are going to be discussing today is his most recent book, Possessive Individualism, A Crisis of Capitalism. Thank you, Professor, for agreeing to be part of the webinar series and the screen is all yours. So oh, thank you, Anisha and Satwick. Um, I'm happy to be here and I welcome all of those of you who are out there watching. Uh, Webinars can be tiring. I know it's no fun to stare at a screen for one and a half hours. So therefore I will pause from time to time, usually at the end of a major theme, to give you a chance to think about and reflect on what you have just heard. A very brief pause may help you process and digest what I have said. We will hold questions until the end, but I want the pacing of my presentation to allow for reflection as we move through this material. Much of it will be new and perhaps quite surprising for some economists to hear. So let's get started. My book, Possessive Individualism, A Crisis of Capitalism, is a diagnostic undertaking. Diagnosis is concerned with finding answers to sentences that start with the words, why or how. In early 2016, I set out to try to understand a number of surprising events taking place around the world. Central to my curiosity were eight distinct phenomena that had become obvious to us during this period. The Great Recession of 2000 and 2009, triggered by the creation of exotic financial instruments, allowed a few clever money wranglers to play risky games with certain asset markets. Global GDP dropped by more than 4% over that period. Seven million Americans lost their home, the core of their retirement income. The so-called Arab Spring in late 2010 and early 2011 in the Middle East and North Africa that promised a new era in the region. However, by 2016, it was clear that the event was not worthy of the op optimistic label Spring. Rather, we saw a renewed authoritarian control across North Africa and the Middle East. 
Third, the subsequent civil war in Syria, Yemen, and several other neighboring countries pushed millions of destitute immigrants north into Western Europe. Fourth, the persistent migration of thousands of Africans risking their lives in dangerous crossings in the Mediterranean, only to be confined to the island of Lampedusa and Italy. Fifth, a suspicious coup attempt in Turkey that reinforced the sentiment that Turkey did not belong in the European Union, where democracy allegedly prevails. Six, the emergence of tough authoritarians in Hungary and Poland revealed that Europe was more susceptible to such events than most Europeans liked to imagine. Both countries continue to be irritants in the European Union. Seven, the rise of aggressive nationalist politics in Brazil, Russia, India, China, and the United States were undermining democratic progress. Authoritarians were on the rise, and they still are. Eighth, and finally, there was the surprising vote by the normally sane English to quit the European Union. They are now learning a harsh lesson. Other events could be mentioned. Why were these events emerging in the early years of the 21st century? It was not supposed to be this way. Here is a set of surprises that demand an understanding. Recall that once the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the future was supposed to be both peaceful and prosperous. Global capitalism would stitch the world together in one large free trade zone where consumers could have what they desired at the lowest possible prices. What a wonderful future that would be. However, by 2016, the evidence did not support this happy picture, and I needed to find out what had gone wrong. In searching for an organizing principle for my quest, I went back to a source that I had earlier found quite inspiring. C.B. McPherson's 1962 book, The Political Theory of Possessive Individualism. I thought here was a conceptual framework that was good to think with. My diagnostic journey thus began with a history lesson concerning how we arrived at our current understanding of what it means to live in a capitalist economy. At this point, I want to pause and ponder the question of why, there's that word again, why it is so rare to hear economists use the word capitalism. We love to talk about markets. We love to talk about exchange. We love to talk about freedom of choice. And since Milton Friedman, many economists really enjoy linking markets with democracy. However, for some reason, economists do not like to talk about capitalism. Did Karl Marx so disgrace the idea of capitalism that economists want to avoid that term? Are there good reasons for these linguistic habits? In the course of writing this book, I believe I've come to understand why economists avoid talking about capitalism. Indeed, the answer is quite clear. Contemporary economics celebrates the sanctity of the rational individual, and yet the central argument in my book is that capitalism has turned these sanctified individuals into the instrument of their own political alienation. The atomized rational individual is both the cause and the effect of our political anger. We are the reason for our unhappiness. It is the Pogo syndrome from the Peanuts cartoon. We have met the enemy and he is us. A few rather odd books and articles have recently appeared claiming that markets and nobody mentions capitalism, markets make everyone virtuous. This is fantasy. I insist that contemporary capitalism has turned everyone into an isolated and nervous striver seeking something that relentless consumption cannot provide. No wonder economists avoid using the term capitalism. When did this problem of the possessive individual get underway? Recall that the 17th century enlightenment created the sovereign individual endowed with certain durable rights. That is the ground upon which contemporary individualism rests. More recently, the full flowering of a globalized market economy following the 1991 collapse of the Soviet Union, coincident with the sweeping economic reforms in China, reinforced the sanctity of the individual as a sapient consumer intent on acquiring what is most desired at the moment. Margaret Thatcher, in a typical lapse of common sense, 
then claim that capitalism had triumphed because there simply is no alternative. Notice that this newly liberated global consumer is endowed with unlimited rights and opportunities, yet bears no obligation to others. Triumphs in the economic sphere meant agreeable incomes and wealth that then reinforced the presumed social and political worth of those so endowed. With such financial advantages gained in the economic sphere, the celebration of cultural success then led to a sense of political entitlement. The evolving system tends in the direction of furthering the current advantage of those who have mastered the system. There are very few reliable checks on the tendency toward economic and political triumph. Paradoxically, a culture of possessive individualism leaves the individual exposed to the self-regarding tendencies of everyone else. In a fully atomized world, the flowering of meritocracy then begins to threaten political coherence and a shared sense of purpose within a community. Meritocracies reward merit, but they also begin to yield policies that reinforce these self-interested inclinations. Soon, self-regarding behavior gives rise to particular basins of attraction, others with approximately similar interests. Much of the Marxian legacy is framed around just such polarized entities, workers and capitalists. However, history reminds us that it is a mistake to presume that workers are united in their interests. Too many workers are willing or forced to toil under conditions that many other workers find unacceptable. Possessive individualism undermines collective action. We here confront the essential flaw in a meritocracy. That flaw is the evolutionary tendency towards exclusionary webs of advantage. There is an endogenous process at work that tends to reinforce a narrow trajectory toward the commanding heights. Nothing in democratic systems can assure modulation of that tendency. But we must also notice that the spread and depth of possessive individualism and capitalism does not prevent some small group of individuals having very pronounced and stringent interests. Those individuals are the owners of capital. A certain unity of purpose defines those individuals who are, to use a popular term of art, job creators. That shared idea of political economic solidarity among a small group of individuals opens a new window into the idea of societies organized along meritocratic lines. Capitalism has a particular idea of the indicators of merit. Wealth is revered while poverty is a correctable condition if only the poor would apply themselves with the necessary discipline. We are told that unions impede efficiency. Regulations are said to stifle innovation and profits. Don't let anything stand in the way of so-called free markets and unbridled accumulation. In capitalism, there are only two organizational entities that warrant our analytical attention. These are households and firms. Possessive individualism advantages firms and stands as the defining threat to the well-being of households. Like the famous account of the fox and the hedgehog, the household and its members are foxes. Their survival requires them to know many things. Firms in capitalism are hedgehogs. They thrive by knowing one very big thing. And the single thing they know is they must fight off any action that might increase their costs. Recall that in the market economy, firms have no control over demand for their product, and competition renders them price takers on the product side of that market. On the supply side, they have little control over the price of necessary raw materials, since those raw materials come from other firms embedded in the same market economy. Firms have little control over taxes levied on them by various units of government. There's only one factor of production for which firms are in rather complete control of the price they must pay, and that factor is hired labor. Notice that hired labor represents potential income to households. During the heights of the Industrial Revolution, the English writer Matthew Arnold claimed that, and I'm quoting, inequality has the natural and necessary effect under the present circumstances of materializing our upper class vulgarizing our middle class 
and brutalizing our lower class. What did Arnold mean by this? Arnold insisted that members of the upper class were materialized by their preoccupation with showy consumption, most of which had no purpose other than to demonstrate just how rich they were. This is what Thorsten Veblen called conspicuous consumption. When Arnold talked of vulgarizing the middle class, he captured the idea that emulation of the consumption habits of the rich, necessarily by more affordable substitutes, was the essence of vulgarity. The middle class was drawn to its crass mimicry of the rich by the hope that doing so would signal to others that they too were rich. Since the social function of the rich has always been to serve as trendsetters, those individuals with less income and wealth seek to buy what the rich are buying, even though such consumption requires spending above their means. They are thereby vulgarized. Finally, Arnold insisted that the lower classes were brutalized because these workers, servants, drivers, gardeners, nannies, general laborers, by virtue of their minimal wages and long hours, helped to keep the upper class in their comfort. The lower class was further brutalized by the middle class, who stood barely above the poor in its evident desire to keep the poor a safe social and economic distance below them. The precarious middle class made sure that the poor were not in doubt about this essential aspect of capitalism. The English aristocracy kept their servants downstairs. Today, the upper class keeps their servants just down the street, working for minimal wages at restaurants, hotels, assorted retail shops, and various service firms. It is important to recall that in the early days of the possessive market society, beginning in Britain around 1600, individualist impulses were kept in check by the realization that all individuals were subject to the same forces of a competitive market. The perception that fate ruled the world meant that the poor understood that situation to be part of some larger scheme of things. Low prices for things that they tried to sell, high prices for things they had to purchase, and hungry times from drought, crop failure, disease, marauding soldiers, and cold, wet winters wreaked havoc on one and all in rather equal measure. That was life, and it was hard all around, and it had been that way forever. In his famous line, Thomas Hobbes talked of life as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. As possessive individualism gained momentum, political voice had previously been restricted to what McPherson called the possessing class. This small group of individuals held most of the wealth and it retained exclusive control over the selection of rather unpleasant sovereign authorities. These ruling elites perceived their material and political entitlements as re reciprocated in their political obligations. The wealthy understood that they were seriously outnumbered by the common man on whose arduous labor they led quite agreeable lives. However, as the 19th century progressed and as the Industrial Revolution produced both profound wealth and stark despair, this historic co coincidence of interest began to dissipate under the assault of an advancing modern state in which the vote began to spread downward. The emergence of a distinct class consciousness central to the writings of Karl Marx was profoundly corrosive of both the political as well as the material cohesion of British society. Marx exposed the emerging deceit of a unified and cohesive population. At the same time, the growing inevitability of competitive markets and an emerging bitter awareness of unequal outcomes for that competition added weight to the gradual disintegration that was now coming into view. When a newly enfranchised working class became aware of possible alternatives, the former tight cohesion of British society was destroyed. With the gradual spread of political voice, ancient cohesion was finally shattered. Soon historic economic relations were no longer accepted as natural or morally compelling. The increasingly unacceptable economic divide further undermined historic notions of a unified political and economic community. By 1920, the English historian R.H. Taney 
observed that Britain was now a grotesque, acquisitive society. These strands of acquisitiveness and vulgar materialism were later woven together by, material, by McPherson, who coined this phrase, possessive individualism. His writings suggest that possessive individualism comprised the dominant organizing idea of British society, beginning as far back as the 17th century, if not before. This disillusion of social cohesion in Britain coincided with the early years of the emerging public order in the United States. What is unmistakable is just how destabilizing, how threatening democracy can be to narrow economic and political privilege. However, there is nothing inherent about democracy that precludes a reemergence of distinct social hierarchies. Among political interests, easier to mobilize in the urban centers of wealth and influence can gradually work to undermine democratic concerns. If such tendencies are allowed to persist unchecked, there can emerge an ossified setting of privilege and correlated misery and political alienation. A mature democracy cannot be understood merely in terms of the affirmation of the rights of individuals for the simple reason that at the core of a fully developed democracy must be found the concept of certain duties, obligations that inhere to all individuals. It is duties, civic obligations that hold political entities together. This balancing of rights and obligations is central to the idea of personhood. As capitalism evolved from merchant capitalism toward a divided possessive society under industrial capitalism, the idea of personhood became of greater importance. In a society or a culture where belonging is measured by one's participation in the activity of gaining a livelihood, the absence of that ability undermines one's personhood. Forced and unwilling absence from meaningful work is destructive of the ability to form enduring family relationships. The cycle of poverty that results is a cancer that pervades many capitalist economies. Keep in mind that the utilitarian vision is that the central purpose of modern society is to offer the widest possible scope for individuals to achieve maximum satisfaction through their consumption choices. However, standing against this simple idea, the vision of personhood insists that individuals are defined by their ability to use and develop their unique human capacities. This view drives from McPherson's idea that the essence of being human is, and I want to quote, not as a consumer of utilities, but as a doer, a creator, an enjoyer of human attributes. Whatever the uniquely human attributes are taken to be, their exertion and development are seen as ends in themselves, not simply as means to consumer satisfaction. Man, I'm sorry, that's the way they wrote in those days, man, woman, is not a bundle of appetites seeking satisfaction, but a bundle of conscious energies seeking to be exerted. Humans are not, I'm repeating myself now, that's the end of McPherson's quote, humans are not a bundle of appetites seeking satisfactions, but a bundle of conscious energies seeking to be exerted. Think about that. To state the obvious, the fundamental contradiction of a possessive capitalist society is the impairment of full personhood for those who must sell their labor power to owners capital if they wish to eat or if they wish to have a head, a roof over their head. That is the fundamental contradiction of a possessive capitalist society. A possessive capitalist society transforms labor power from an endowment into a marketable commodity that must be offered for rent or for sale to those who own capital. That is why Karl Polanyi called labor a fictitious commodity. The obvious problem is that owners of capital receive a variety of advantages and protections that are not available to those who own only their labor power. A grant of legitimacy for unlimited accumulation in a possessive capitalist society bestows a wealth trajectory on owners of capital that is not available to those who own only their labor power. There is no moral sanction for this difference. 
nor is there any economic reason for such differential accumulation. This fact stands as the single most important explanation for the staggering inequality, both within individual countries and across countries around the world. The abiding challenge of our time concerns finding an answer to the timeless question of what exactly we owe to each other. Possessive individualism offers a clear and definitive answer, not much. Possessive individualism is the reigning idea of our time. It is the accepted spirit of our age, and it is the cultural legacy of the long evolutionary trajectory of capitalism. We are now in the fourth phase of capitalism, one that I call managerial capitalism. Managerial capitalism is the inevitable successor to financial capitalism because it allows exquisite control by the wranglers of capital on the only thing that really matters, the one big idea. Surprisingly, that idea is not the relentless pursuit of profits. It cannot be because profit is an unknown and fickle accounting effect of various causes. Profit can only be reckoned at the end of an accounting year and its causes always remain confounded. But the one thing, the one big idea that the hedgehog knows is to stay focused on reducing costs. This imperative reveals itself in various forms, all of which redound to the benefit of those with the highly specialized skills of micromanagement and political connections. The obvious problem for economists is that manager, managerial capitalism has been given intellectual legitimacy by the evolution of microeconomic theory into a device for the pursuit of efficient markets, for the relentless focus on transactions costs, the cost of gaining information about potential market opportunities, the cost of writing contracts to exploit those precious opportunities, and the cost of enforcing those contracts once they've been struck. Each of these cost-reducing imperatives privileges those trained and acculturated into the arcane world of the transaction. Those well-honed habits of mind go far in explaining the great divergence of livelihoods in the metropolitan core of Western Europe and the so-called new world, as opposed to the periphery, what we call the third world. Notice that the global economy is now divided into winners and losers. We see regular accounts of the losers, the struggling citizens of South Sudan, Syria, Iraq, Venezuela, Nigeria, Somalia, Libya, Yemen, Afghanistan, countless other problematic settings. Most of these places have not been ignored by the experts who advise on how to bring about economic development. Unfortunately, their abundant advice has been confidently, pre confidently predicated on the possessive individualism of their metropolitan upbringing and their training in economics with notions of efficient markets, celebrations of the atomistic individual and the imperative of reducing transactions costs. Just let markets work so we can get prices right. The resulting ideology of so-called free markets has been visited upon, often imposed upon weak societies and weaker governments throughout the world. In the 1980s, this cadre of development experts imposed structural adjustment programs on struggling economies. So-called market-friendly reforms were the order of the day. Then the Ten Commandments of the Washington Consensus solidified those structures, and conditionality was an excuse to impose even more market ideology. Unfortunately, this prescriptive imperative was imposed on economies and societies that resembled the merchant capitalism of Britain in the early 1700s. This imposed ideology forced many poor countries to leap over 200 years of gradual economic evolution. The resulting political backlash was profound. Indeed, the emergence of the non-aligned nations movement in the 1970s, of which India was a prominent leader, was precisely to resist the neo-colonialism that required countries to stand firm against communism and to eagerly embrace Western capitalism. If such countries wish to be our friends, they must adopt our economic ideology. We see therefore that the crisis of capitalism is not confined to the rural counties of the United States, 
Does it, does it reside only in the forgotten industrial towns of Northern England, where Brexit voters are thick on the ground? It is not confined to Northeast France or the devastated coal regions of Belgium. The crisis of capitalism is now a universal phenomenon. The beleaguered household throughout the world is now facing a problematic existence. I want to talk a minute about the role of economics. <clears throat> In my book, I call contemporary economics the dubious enabler. The discipline of economics, elaborating and celebrating the created individual of the Enlightenment, has crafted a suite of concepts and practices that constitute justificationism. Much of contemporary economics at the micro level is misleading in its assumptions, willful in its presentation, and contrived in its conclusions. The central idea of rationality, the rational individual, is circular and is thus a profound deception. Excuse me. Sorry, I hope I'm back with you. <coughs> its purpose has been to situate rational calculation, maximizing utility, at the center of human behavior. And here we find the central problem. The allegedly rational individual does not exist, unless, of course, the word rational has no coherent meaning, or unless the benediction of rational is a mere compliment that economists pay ourselves for how we talk about human choice. It must be observed that utility cannot be a reason for doing anything at all. People have their reasons, and utility is not a reason. Utility is simply a made up index that allows economists to pretend we understand human choice in action. No one is fooled by our contrivances. The popularity of contemporary economic concepts and the acquired habits of mind based on those concepts are exposed as a perverse contamination that has undermined the aspirations of the Enlightenment. Freed from the chains of ancient superstition, the autonomous individual has since been re-enslaved in the service of industrial capitalism and its offspring. Today, the individual is regarded as nothing but a consumer trying to maximize utility. Therein lies incoherence and disbelief. Contemporary economics provides a misleading account of how a market economy actually does its work. The standard economic message accepted by the population at large, but especially by the political class, is one of a benevolent sig signaling system that guides the rational individual toward utility maximizing transactions. The origin of this happy account of capitalism is no surprise. As I noted above, when Soviet communism collapsed of its own, own incoherence, the triumphalism solidified in the public mind the idea that capitalism was the best of all possible systems. Economics as taught and practiced in the capitalist world provided the theoretical justification for why that was the case. We must understand this as apologetics. Important here is the evolutionary trajectory of the household from pre-capitalist provisioning into merchant capitalism in the 14th century, evolving into industrial capitalism at the end of the 18th century, and then into financial capitalism, and finally, in the early years of the 21st century, what I call managerial capitalism. Each stage in this evolutionary pathway has rendered the household increasingly marginalized and precarious. Coincidence with this difficult journey for the household, the increasingly atomized individual within the household has become more isolated and more tenuously engaged with a meaningful livelihood. The possessive individual is now the victim of her own liberation brought by the Enlightenment. As I indicated earlier, the modern household now resembles the wily fox who must know many things, who must rely on a portfolio, of survival strategies. Gone are the days when a household with one income earner could hope to achieve a plausible middle-class lifestyle. Many households contain multiple earners engaged in more than a single job. For millions of individuals in the metropolitan core, so-called full-time work is now a remote dream when considered against the daily scramble of juggling children, schooling, aging parents, unreliable and often affordable childcare, flawed urban transportation, and many other aspects of modern life. 
Meanwhile, a class of individuals, they were once called captains of industry, now sits astride massive accumulations of liquid assets easily deployed to capture the immediate attention of sweatshop clothing manufacturers in Bangladesh, Cambodia, or Vietnam, or electronic device assemblers in East Asia. Global commerce is now orchestrated by a class of financial wranglers, hedge fund conjurers, and private equity tormentors who, like the reliable hedgehog, need to know only one big thing. And the one thing they know is that they can render low wage workers unemployed at the click of a mouse button on their computer. They bear no responsibility for their actions because they are divorced from place and the social attachments that arise from being embedded in a social community. They are everywhere, but they are from nowhere. While daily life in the metropolitan core of Western Europe, America, and parts of Asia is characterized by financial anxiety, life in the poor periphery has always been precarious and problematic. It is necessary to acknowledge that their enduring misery can be traced to the growth and spread of capitalism in the metropolitan core. The problematic periphery is littered with ineffectual notional states. By a notional state, I mean political jurisdictions with the mask of citizenship precludes coherent governance. The mask of citizenship caps the idea, captures the idea that individuals reside in a particular political jurisdiction, we would call it a nation state, but they are not of that jurisdiction. The central element in the mask of citizenship is the absence of a coherent binding tax bargain. The modern nation state in the wealthy metropole is characterized by a historic and secure tax bargain. Citizens are part of a social compact in which they understand that the payment of a certain suite of taxes represents their commitment to the larger public good. But it also represents something much more profound. It acknowledges in exchange for those tax receipts, the government accepts the reciprocal obligation to provide a suite of goods and services that could not be made Otherwise, national defense, roads and bridges, schooling, local police, garbage collection, then the provision of reasonably safe drinking water are just a few of these. The payment of taxes not only funds those necessary collective consumption goods, it provides the citizens a plausible claim on the attention of government agencies when the quality of that service fails to live up to expectations of those who paid for it. The tax bargain is an essential binding agent of the citizenship exchange that characterizes the modern nation state. However, as we know, many countries in the poor periphery do not levy taxes on their citizens. Instead, they rely on excise taxes levied on exports to the rich metropole. Government income is thus derived from timber, minerals, oil, perhaps a few agricultural products that bring revenue directly into the treasury. These excise tax receipts are divorced from any accountability to the citizens and in fact often work to the detriment of those citizens when local natural resources are made available to international corporations for exports to global centers of manufacturing. Furthering the problem with no revenue available to local units of government, states, counties, villages, these political entities must beg the central government for funds to pay for schools, roads, communication facilities, libraries, water supply, what have you. And in this necessity to solicit the central government for funds, we find yet another mechanism for political graft and corruption. This political reality of revenue mobilization in the poor periphery epitomizes the perverse mask of citizenship we find in much of the developing world. Central governments pretend to care about all of their citizens scattered across the poor countryside, but in fact, receiving nothing from them in the way of tax payments, governments have little incentive to pay attention to the needs and aspirations of the citizenry. We must acknowledge that this situation, a world of politically dysfunctional notional states, is the plausible result of colonialism throughout Africa, South and Southeast Asia, and the Middle East, and to a lesser extent in South and Central America. This long troubled period of external control, one that was not eliminated in many places until after World War II, was motivated by the logic of surplus extraction. Colonial powers were motivated to establish, 
were motivated to establish administrative structures and processes in their distant possessions in order to extract raw materials for the Metropolitan Corps. Included in these desired imports were oil, tropical timber, precious minerals, spices, condiments, tea, coffee, and most despicably, slaves. The point of colonialism was not to improve tax collections or to create enhanced governance. Christian missionaries were there to convert souls and colonial administrators were there to collect raw materials and convert them into new income streams in the metropole. These colonial possessions were mere supply depots for industrial capitalism and their defective governance today is the inevitable result of that unpleasant history. Possessive individualism shaped their past and it continues to undermine their future. I come to a section called, what is to be done? Escape from the ravages of possessive individualism requires a practical account, a theory of how human systems are continually undergoing adaptation and accommodation to new stresses and strains. We must keep in mind that all human systems are constantly in the process of becoming. Becoming, all societies are constantly becoming. What is the animating spring of human action? The philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce insisted that doubt and surprise are the springboards of creative thought. He wrote, quote, the action of thought is excited by the irritation of doubt and ceases when belief is attained, so that the production of belief is the sole function of thought. I love this phrase. We go through life without thought. We go through life without thinking. We go through life habituated to certain behaviors. We do not really think until we are confronted by doubt and surprise. We're back to diagnostics. Why? Why are things this way? In my book, I present a model of human systems as purposeful evolutionary going concerns. I further argue that this gradual evolution in social structures consists of three phases. Animation, what's the problem? What can we do about it? Adjustment, we must reorganize things so that things work differently. And adaptation, now that there's a new institutional structure in place, we must change our behavior accordingly. The essential springboard, animation, arises from what I call Persian doubt. Why is unemployment so high? Why are people so angry? Why are labor relations so bad? Those are the why questions. That's diagnostics that comes from doubt. We must acknowledge that this process of change and adaptation is one of the most difficult undertakings for the human psyche. We come to love and revere what has become familiar to us. We like our ruts, or most of them. The human mind adapts itself to familiar routines, and once those routines become normal, we also come to regard them as right, as correct, and as worth defending. Change is difficult, isn't it? But of course, change is inevitable and change is necessary. In understanding the complex process of social change, it is necessary to consider the philosopher John Dewey and what is known as Dewey's Ark. Not Noah's Ark, Dewey's Ark, A-R-C. In that regard, Dewey, con Dewey considers our experiences to be of paramount importance. He wrote that, and I'm quoting, the nature of experience can be understood only by noting that it includes an active and a passive element. On the active hand, experience is trying, a meaning which is made explicit in the connected term experiment. Experience, experiment. On the passive side, it is undergoing. When we experience something, we act upon it. We do something with it. Then we suffer or undergo the consequences. The connection of these two phases of experience measures the fruitfulness or the value of that experience. Experience as trying involves change, but change is meaningless transition unless it is consciously connected with the return wave of consequences that flow from it. When an activity is continued into the undergoing of consequences, 
when the change made by action is reflected back into a change made in us, we learn something. That's why Dewey was so preoccupied with experimentation. One of Dewey's famous, famous statements was, life is a process of putting our value judgments on trial, putting our ideas on trial to see how they work. And they work by how they work on us and how they affect change in us so that we move forward. With this model of Dewey's arc in mind, it is possible to consider two necessary changes that will defeat the cancer of possessive individualism. First, we must abandon the fiction that economics is a scientific and objective pursuit that stands apart and distinct from social norms, values, politics, and government. When we teach students about the alleged efficiency and sanctity of the private firm, and I put that in quotes, we have abandoned any opportunity to rescue contemporary life from the ravages of possessive individualism. Rather, we must help students and the larger public and our colleagues, which will be a difficult sell, we must help them understand that the firm can only be understood as a public trust. There is no such thing as the private firm. All firms are a public trust. They exist to serve us, not themselves. This would then eliminate all of the incoherent talk of government intervention in the market. I used to forbid my students from using the term government intervention. After all, this revered thing called the market is itself a social construct. If you doubt that, consider how the market economy of Norway or Sweden or Denmark differs so profoundly from the American or the British version of a market economy. There's where culture comes in. The Anglo-American market differs profoundly from the Scandinavian market. Why? Culture matters. History matters. The economic system is a predicated upon cultural norms. Scandinavian capitalism is unrecognizable to an American and vice versa. Second, there must be a reimagining of the individual. That necessary reimagining demands that we embrace an idea that disappeared under the conceits of the Enlightenment, the emergence of neoclassical economics, and the full flowering of possessive individualism under capitalism. That idea, so alien to the modern citizen of the global economy, is obligation. Modernism has brought us an illusion, a presumption of individual rights and in that abundance of self-interested claims to special standing, the idea of obligations has fallen away. Can it be any mystery why the angry resident of rural America or Eastern Germany or the North of England is so worked up over immigrants? The selfish citizen is the social and economic manifestation of what Richard Dawkins likes to call the selfish gene. I argued that full personhood can only be rescued by drawing on an idea from a philosopher, Josiah Royce, R-O-Y-C-E. Royce was writing during the height of the crushing and de dehumanizing industrial revolution. And he advanced the idea of loyalty. Loyalty seems more congenial than obligation. Royce liked to talk of burdened loyalty to community. I suggested in this quaint notion of loyalty, we might just find the key to rescue the future from the perverse ravages of possessive individualism. In this regard, I want to call attention to the profound ideas of the economist Albert Hirschman. If you don't know about Albert Hirschman, I urge you to check him out. H-I-R-S-C-H-M-A-N, Albert Hirschman. 1970, he wrote a book entitled Exit, Voice, and Loyalty, colon, Response to decline in firms, organizations, and states. Imagine that, exit, voice, and loyalty. This little thin book will be one of the most profound experiences for you, and I urge you to check it out. Hirschman's approach stands in as, as an early warning about the serious defects in, in contemporary economics. Moreover, he showed us the distinct importance of loyalty to the performance of any economic system. Loyalty is the essence of commitment to a cause, and a cause is something, and a cause is something that goes beyond the safe comfort 
of the isolated individual, extending one's awareness and consciousness beyond the ego bound self requires effort. It is a chore. It can be unsettling and it can take work to initiate it and to sustain it. Being conscious of others is a burden and burdens require commitment. Commitment is evidence of loyalty to something beyond the ego, beyond what is familiar, beyond what is comfortable. Expanding one's domain of familiarity, what Dewey would call trying, is only enriching if that effort constitutes an undergoing. And this requires that the new realm of familiarity must be an active participant in the trying and undergoing. Dewey's arc reaches back and alters us. In closing, I want to reflect on the central question for all of us. What is this thing called economics? Since the early 1930s, our discipline has been a prisoner of Lionel Robbins and his bizarre notion that economics concerns the allocation of scarce resources to meet unlimited wants. The necessary methodological presumption for this cramped definition of our field is the fiction that economics is an objective science. And from this, we arrive at the strange idea that a science concerns prediction. This is nonsense. Sheer nonsense. The essence of any science, its guiding purpose, is to understand what we observe but cannot explain. The essence of any science is to understand what we observe but cannot explain. How bizarre it is to teach students that microeconomics is the study of consumption and that welfare is based on consumption. Just imagine the harm that has risen from this approach to our subject. To correct this defect, I urge us to reimagine the discipline of economics as being the study of how societies choose to organize themselves for their material and social provisioning. Economics must be recast as a study of how societies choose to organize themselves. How do you organize society? For our material and social provisioning. Doing so would allow us to study a wide array of pressing economic phenomena that are now off limits, according to the cramped vision inherited from Lionel Robbins and Milton Friedman. Just imagine the possibilities that can arise by this escape from having to view everything through the eyes of a utility maximizing agent. We would be free to investigate all of the important circumstances that now comprise the constraints in our existing trivial models of choice. This would be an economics that situates the well being of households at the center of its analytical models. Not the household as a mere unit of consumption, but the household as the seat of living, of provisioning, and of social recreation. Recall from above the words of McPherson to be human means that we are not mere consumers of utility, it is we are a doer, a creator an enjoyer of human attributes. Man is not a bundle of appetites seeking satisfaction, but a bundle of energies seeking to be exerted. The implication is clear. If economics is to be relevant to the contemporary world, it must be reconstituted to reflect the essence of what it means to be human. Thank you so much for allowing me to share these thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, it's, it's so enlightening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bromley. Now, Anisha and uh, Shyam, uh, we, we are open for uh, any questions, uh, comments, uh, please. Uh, Anisha, you, you will take over the Thank you, Professor. This was a very wonderful talk. I think there was just so many ideas that all of us had to download in this very packed <laughs> one hour of talk. So um, clearly, I think all our audiences are still sort of processing all the information that has gone in. And might I just uh, add here that you can unmute yourself and ask your questions, or you can also post your questions in the chat box. Um, oh, there is, uh, okay, something else. So, uh, Okay, I, I, I think while we give some time for our audience, I can make like a quick 
uh, comment to our speaker with regards to the central focus of how we can sort of overcome this possessive individualism is focusing on the households rather than the firms, which has become like the main idea for economics of today. Being an economic student, that's what I have learned uh, for, for all the training that make more profits through reducing more costs, find more resources that are cheaper. So that has been what has gone into teaching all the scholars of economics, students of economics, to bring back the, um, not just employability of the households, not just their consuming capacities, not just labor requirements, but looking at the fact that they do well, there is more welfare associated with households. How do you think that can come into the stream of economics and how do you think you can push that in the pedagogy or the curriculum as of now? Okay, I have, uh, I, I know there's, there are several questions that have been posted as well, Anisha. So how, how, how should I best proceed here? So you can begin with my question first, because I took it first. <laughs> uh, and then I will just ask all the people who have posted their questions to unmute in the order that they have been posted to raise okay. it to you. Yeah. Give me your question in one sentence, Anisha, please. How do you think the households being the center of economics can be brought into the stream of uh, the study as of now? Thank you. I thought that's what you wanted. Uh, we don't pay attention to the household. The way, the, the way to bring the household into our models of economics is to understand the household as the center of activity in our society. Think how prominently we regard the firm. The firm is this thing. Uh, we, we spend months teaching students about the firm and how it maximizes profit and, and all of that mechanistic stuff. And then it was come, when it comes time to talk about the household, what do we do? We put up models of consumption and we tell people that households get utility by consuming goods and services. And if prices go down, uh, welfare goes up. And if prices go up, welfare goes up. So we have this completely artificial and contrived notion of the household, which is not about the household at all. It's about how much consumption takes place by this entity, okay? Recently, economics has begun to see the household as a firm. So now all of a sudden we see the household, we write firm behavior models of the household and we turn people into uh, factors of production inside of this black box called the household, don't we? The reason we do this is because we are afraid that we will be seen as normative, we will be seen as subjective if we begin to talk about the household as the center of all social arrangements, okay? Because you cannot reduce it to utilities, you cannot reduce it to maximization of something. So my, my sense is that the household needs to be reseen, reconfigured, reconstituted as the basis of the expenditures of energy and of creativity in a society, not as a consumption unit. Does that, does that, do you see, does that respond to your question, Anisha? Yes, it does. But I think there needs to be a little bit more on, because we sort of quantify everything when we learn the form theory. So exactly we have to break the shackles of just quantifying everything when we want to learn something like the household. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. We, as I, as I say, we, economists are unable to imagine the economic problem without writing it down as a maximization problem. And, and, and if you're going to maximize something, then you need a set of constraints and you need an objective function. And since we don't know what people want, We'll make it up that they want more utility. So then that allows us to close the model and then we can do our maximization. So in a sense, it, we have become, and this is, not a, this is not unique to me. I mean, many people reckon we have become slaves to our method. Our method is, is a maximization. We can, economists cannot imagine thinking about an economic problem without a maximization algorithm in their mind. And, 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 and once you start down that road, You've locked yourself in to a set of questions that are that are admissible and a set of answers that seem reasonable. All right, so we will move now to the next question, uh, which was by Nepati. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, thank you so much for a brilliant uh, presentation of your book. Um, I learned quite a lot. As you were speaking, I kind of get the gist that what you're saying is um, 
people are more than consumers. They are creative, you know, and it's a mixture of all these other, all these social activities of a human being uh, that forms society. As you know, right now in the world, there's this push for universal basic income. Right. What are your thoughts about it in reference to what you just said about humans as doers and creators? Yes, yes, thank you. Is that, is that it? Can I go? Yes, that's my first question. Yeah, I'll go. Okay, good. Uh, wonderful. I, uh, I think it was 20 years ago, I had a master's student who came to me and wanted to write a master's thesis on universal basic income. There was quite a book, I think, Von Paris, a uh, uh, fellow, P-A-R-I-J-S, I believe, had written a book about universal basic income. Uh, so let's, let, let me just, I have a very quick answer for it. Uh, it would make a great deal of sense to have something like that. And perhaps be means tested so that many people, many households, don't deserve this, but a universal basic income scaled to some level would do a number of important things. It would give workers choice in the marketplace, right? And it would provide the very basic kinds of things that, uh, that every household must have. Uh, if we noticed, I made some statement about how Scandinavian capitalism differs so very much from, from American capitalism. Scandinavians have basically this, they have child allowances, the Brits even have child allowances. In a sense, that is almost a universal basic income. So I'm in favor of it. It needs to be designed carefully. Uh, but it is, it breaks that lock that firms have over households. At the moment, the only way a household can survive is to sell its labor power to a firm or to go on, quote, welfare, and welfare has a stigma. So if we, could, if we could bring a universal basic income in, it changes the way we talk about the market, doesn't it? Because no longer is this, it's not welfare anymore, but it's a basic support for necessities. So let me keep my answer short because I think there are lots of questions. All right, next one we have from uh, uh, Danish. So his question, I will just read it out. He's been posting it in the chat is, during the Syrian war, Arab Spring, Angela Merkel opened borders for refugees and migrants. How did it affect the economy of Germany? Please comment. Would we consider migrants as a part of household domain? Okay, I, I, I heard several things here, Anisha. One of them was, how did migrants affect Germany? That was, that was part of this question. But it, there, earlier, there was just a general statement about open borders and migrants. Am I, am I correct, Anisha? You're correct, right. Yeah. My ears are quite old, Anisha, so they, they don't work as well as my mouth, so I worry about what I hear. But let me, uh, I think I got it. Uh, well, in a sense, the immigration problem, uh, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't use the word problem, the immigration issue, in a sense, is, a, is an indication of the failure of nation states throughout the world to provide meaningful livelihood prospects for their citizens. So let's understand that very few people wish to leave their homeland. I believe people are pushed out. They are not drawn to Western Europe. They are pushed out of Syria. They're pushed out of Libya. They're pushed out of Senegal because of absence of feasible livelihood. So that's, a, we need to look at the immigration issue, not a problem, but the immigration issue as a failure of nation states to provide coherent opportunities for their, for their citizens. Are we clear on this? Very few people want to leave home. Is that right? That's my sense. So then I think the, the question about Germany was came up because uh, Germany managed this issue in a very smart way. Uh, you might know that after World War II, Germany was very short of labor, and they created a system where many people from Turkey could come into Germany and to work. So there was a need. There was, there was a, a, a Pareto better, sorry, Pareto better solution to the problem. This recent thing of million immigrants going into Germany was, a, was exactly the same thing. They didn't just open the borders and say, come on in. It was a program. You would expect the Germans to do it this way. It was a program. We need, we need work 
workers over here. We need, and they trained them. So th there was a conscious effort to integrate this mobile labor into the economic system and to help them get situated, to help them. That's the way immigration ought to work. Did I answer the, the points of the question? I think Danish would be happy to have that answer from you. I think we can move on to the next one until unless we get a reply from Danish. Yeah, uh, just one thing, Anisha. Can we refer to Andrew's question? Because Andrew has raised his hand first before his hand. Definitely, down. yes. Andrew can speak. Uh... You want me to speak the question? Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for your interesting talk. Um, in, in it, you referred to the fickle nature of profit and the emphasis on reducing costs for firms. Uh, surely the priority of business owners is to ensure capital gain. And if so, what role does land ownership play in this game? In, in the UK, land value forms a major component of our national wealth. Could you say something about the role of land? Does, does an understanding of the importance of land to wealth creation have a role to play in rolling back on the effects of possessive individualism? Oh boy, oh wow, thank you. Where to start on this one, huh? Uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll say it's kind of an inside joke, maybe I should start with uh, single tax and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, the issue of landed wealth as unearned increment, but I'd rather not start there. I, I, I you started with with profit, and then you got into wealth maximization, and they got into land. As I'm trying to recreate the question here, uh, am I recreating it right? And I'd, I'd yeah. like to stop it. Before, but anyway, the it's firm, just the, the the emphasis on on capital gain. Yeah. The, the, but, but capital gains is a taxation trick, okay? I mean, to me, the point is, uh, my, I think you started with my, my statement about profit. The, my, what I meant by that is that firms have no idea what their profit situation is going to be. They cannot tell. That's an accounting thing, depending on the, the taxing jurisdiction in which you live. So when we tell students that firms maximize profit, that's really not true because firms can't do that. What I think firms do is they wish to maximize the probability that they will survive the current fiscal year, okay? So I have a very kind of Darwinian idea of what motivates the firm. And that is, you cannot survive the year, you can't go into next year if you don't have some retained earnings. We can call that profit, we can reinvest it, we can call it wealth, what have you. So to me, the motive, and I believe this because we want students to understand what, what, how firms operate. And it fits into my possessive individual story because the one thing that firms can control is their cost structure, labor. They have, as I said, they have little control over what they pay for other goods for their factors of production because those two come from markets. So my point was that the household stands exposed to, to the power of firms, if I may, because it is the one factor of production that firms can acquire outside of the normal workings of the market. That's the point I wanted to make, Andrew. And I, I'd kind of like to stay away from land and, and all that stuff, if we could. I'd love to carry on a conversation with you about that another time. But land wealth, uh, I edited a journal called Land Economics for a long time. I'm not interested in land wealth. I'd like to tax away all under an increment that accumulates to land. But that's another whole contest here. Sorry, Andrew, how'd I do? Not so well, huh? Yeah, well, uh, uh, thank you. I, I understand your conclusion, at least, and I, I, I would support that approach. Okay. Thank you. I don't want to be evasive. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind being evasive. I just don't even set out to be evasive. <laughs> <laughs> so if we have Vakit Amin Hussain who wanted to ask a question, he can go ahead by unmuting himself. Okay. All right, Diana, until then, go ahead, pose your question. Hi, thank you so much for your uh, lecture. I really enjoyed it. Uh, to me, the central piece of everything you said is the idea of economics as a habit of mind, which of course is related to economics being a fiction. And my question is, 
economists have a tendency to disregard uh, history and they constantly try to deny that economics is a social science. Unfortunately, is a social science from the point of view of contemporary economics. My idea is, is a certain idea of progress guiding this habit of mind in economics. An idea of progress that is constantly advancing, which is connected to the enlightenment uh, and the individualism that you mentioned. So what role does the idea of progress plays in the current state of affairs and what could we do conceptually to change it? Thank you. Well, wow, good for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's all teleological, isn't it? Teleological. It's all teleological. It's all progress. Getting rich, getting accumulation. This is progress, isn't it? This is this is modernity. Huh? This to be modern is to is to uh, so the creation of the individual itself is a, is a is a metaphor for progress and few of us would want to go back to the time of superstition and all of that stuff right and fate so we we kind of like the progression we're on uh we do believe it's progress we do think we're smarter than the people in medieval times although i look around and i see all this behavior about getting vaccinated and so on and i wonder if people really have progressed very much in their intelligence since the since the year 1000 but let's, we don't get into this pandemic politics but so yes it is all progress and and part of it is the the richer we get the, therefore we think we're smarter and so i think it all feeds back on itself that our wisdom our management the, the way we can, the art of the deal, we can do these clever things. Aren't we smart? That's progress. So wealth under, I mean, what does capitalism revere? It reveres the accumulation of wealth. Okay. And that is good. And progress is good. So I like your, I like your question. I like your historical thing. And I, and, and the point we want to understand and, and we don't teach economics this way, but economics is the essence of the socialization of a set of values about getting rich and accumulation. Is that, is that what you're asking about? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's very sad. My, my background is in philosophy, so that's why I asked this question. I, I, had, a, I, had, a, I had a slight odor of philosophy in your question there. So yes, of course. I mean, it, but you know, we're all, as, as Nietzsche said, we're just humans, aren't we? Right? I mean, there's no right way about what progress looks like. That's for us to make up, is it not? Okay. Yeah. And, and, and as Marshall Solins remind us, the, you know, the ancient people, the, you know, the, 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 his original affluent society, people used to work for three or four hours a day, gathering what they needed to eat. And then they sat around the rest of the day and wrote poetry and played dominoes. And that was the original affluent society, wasn't it? Well, now we have a whole different idea of what progress is and what affluence brings to us and how important it is and how you measure worth, right? Who our heroes are. Our heroes are rich people. They go to space. Look, aren't they wonderful? Okay, enough. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. There was this one question by Muhammad Waqif Amin Hussain. He posted it, but he could not unmute himself. So I'll just pose that question to you. So he says, and I quote, I found the idea on the role of experience in social change quite fascinating. Do you see the failure of communist experiment, say the fall of Berlin War, as an albatross, an ominous reminder of letting go of individual autonomy on possibilities of progressive world order or social political reform? Uh, Anisha, I was with you until you said, do I find the something? And I, I lost, I lost the thread, okay. but please. Let me just repeat from there. Do you see there, the thing? Can I read it over here on the side someplace? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, you can. You can just Where is it? Chat here. Whose question is it? Uh, I'll, I'll just repost and tell her about it. Yeah, Sathvik is done. Yeah. The last one. Oh, oh, yeah, I see it. Do I see the failure of the communist experiment as an albatross, an ominous reminder of letting go of individual? That's that's the question. Is that right? 
Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, well, all right. Communism, socialism, these are isms. These are, these are terms applied to uh, political systems that, uh, that are in, have, have, have revealed their basic flaw, uh, partly because of who it was that decided to become the implementer of, of the system. So you cannot separate the Chinese experience, experiment, let us call it, the Chinese experiment from the awfulness of uh, Mao Zedong. And you cannot separate the failures of the Soviet Union from the awfulness of uh, Joseph Stalin. So uh, those guys gave isms a bad name. Uh, between the two of them, I think they're responsible for the death of maybe 100 million people. Uh, these cannot in any way be regarded as feasible systems. And so I'm, I'm not advocating socialism, not advocating communism. I don't like those terms. Those terms don't mean anything. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, what's, what's the point here? Is it, I, I, I think I reject, if I understand the question, I think I reject the idea that it's either or, that it's the albatross of communism as Mao tried to do it, or socialism as Stalin tried to do it, and neither one of them gave it a nickel's worth of time for what the ism they were advocating. They were political tyrants like the world sees today. Uh, but it's not that or uh, the awful possessive individualism that I'm talking about. It's there, there, there's something else. I, I'm not a designer. I'm a diagnostician. I have a few ideas about design, but I, I'm a firm believer that people create their own reality. People create their future through, through experimentation. Let our values guide us. That's all we have. As Nietzsche said, human, all too human. That's all we are. Have I responded to this question? Oh, he says thank you, yes. And we have time for one last question by Tejinder. Tejinder, you can mute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so um, uh, I, I have one question. Like, how do you see the post-democratic society in relation with current capitalist crisis where civil society has hostile relation with democratic institution and unable to assert their agency. Uh, so thank you, I, I'm reading your question too. Post-democratic society, so you think we're in post-democratic -democ societies now because of the rise of these authoritarian regimes. I think that's what you mean by that. We've, we're beyond democracy now because of, of Xi in China, and, uh, and, and, and other places. Uh, so in a sense, how do I, uh, let's see, how do I see post-democratic society relations with the current capitalism crisis where civil society has a hostile relation with democratic institutions also, yes. Well, I'm a firm believer in, in democracy. I don't know what it is, but I know what it isn't. And my sense of these authoritarians, let me just speak about our friend Xi in China, there to the north of you folks. Uh, I see what she's doing as a, an indicator of fundamental economic and political tensions at home. I'm a pragmatist and I believe that actions tell us a lot about what's going on. And so she looks like a, 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 a grasping authoritarian, but I think what she is actually doing is he's on the defensive against an economic system and against a cohort of young people who were beginning to enjoy democracy, beginning to enjoy the market. Okay, they don't have capitalism, but they like the market. They like young people like the goodies you can buy. And I see she's uh, authoritarian tendencies as a defensive move to deal with the coming political unrest from severe economic problems in China. So I don't think we're in a post-democratic phase. I think countries, uh, they go through evolutionary trajectories uh, and uh, and, and, and so authoritarianism is a losing proposition. The history of the world is clear that authoritarian rulers ultimately fall because 
The wonderful thing about young people, there's always a new cohort of them every year. And a lot of young people always come into the system and they're not socialized into the authoritarian regime that they become socialized into and they don't like it. So are we in a post-democratic era? We might be in an era where democracies have, have shown themselves ineffective. And I think, again, it's because of the, of the economic system that is now pervade. No wonder people are upset uh, not only in, in the U.S., but many, many places, because the economic system is not delivering the goods. That's not an indictment of democracy. It's an indictment of the way in which the capitalist system has, has marginalized many, many households. I think, that's, I think I should stop there. And we have time only for these many questions. But uh, if you have time, Professor Bromley, we can have an informal session after we stop recording, if that's okay with you, for people who want to really discuss with you. I'm a retired professor who laments the loss of a classroom full of eager questions. So I'll stay all day if you wish, but it's getting late there. But yes, I'm, I'm here, whatever you want. All right, so we, will, we have officially closed out on our uh, main session and now we can request uh, all our participants to join us towards the informal session where they can feel more free to pose questions. Um, Satvik, would you like to propose a vote of thanks? Uh, uh, what else I can add? I'm grateful for uh, Professor Bromley's time and uh, the presentation. I was a little bit cellbound, but uh, I, we can see the kind of question we're receiving. Uh, it's very engaging session and I'm very happy. Uh, I thank my co-organizer, Anisha and Chiam, and also our coordinators, uh, Arun, uh, Varsha, and Agdas. Um, Heske Vandornen uh, Van has uh, designed the posters uh, from YSI New York. Uh, we'd like to thank her for the support. And I thank all the participants. Please join us for the next ses uh, upcoming sessions if you have time and interest. So thank you. That's all. <laughs>